And we are moving on to the next presentation immediately with our next speaker. We heard about trends already today. Trends are a major topic, but how do I know what the trends are? How should I know what uh, moves people, what people are really interested in? And for this, there is a methodology called op opinion mining. Now, opinion mining is the tool which allows you to take a look into people's heads or minds, ideally. And one guy who really knows exactly how to do it because he's been working with large volumes of data for many years in successful industries like the car industry, but also increasingly for retailers. That's um, Gianluca Daniele Speranza, who is co-founder and technological lead at Cauliflower. And I'm very happy to welcome him, him here today. Please come to me. We will start immediately with your presentation. And I think if our guests here then hear, when they hear what you have to say, then I'm sure that they will come back to uh, the places they occupied before. I guess some are still talking to the previous speakers, but it's such an exciting topic that we should be able to attract people back to this room. Right, hello everyone. Good afternoon. What I'm still missing is this little device that I have to click on to go to the next chart. So is it maybe the previous speaker took it along with him or her? And then I can start. Ah, okay. Super. Then yeah, vielen Dank für die Right, excellent. Thank you for the friendly introduction, the nice words. And I'm Gianluca Speranza. I'm one of the co-founders of Cauliflower. And at Cauliflower, we are using primarily AI-based text and speech analysis to facilitate decision-making for companies. One of our methodologies is the so-called opinion mining. And the very first question here is, what is the problem that I try to solve with it? And what does this method actually do? Now, opinion mining. Opinion mining is a methodology by means of which customers and potential customers, consumers are understood. And we do it on the basis of AI-based um, text research. And uh, what we want to cope with is a flood of feedback. There are lots of data which you receive. You could data from, get data from reviews from a CRM tool. It could be customer inquiries, emails, telephone conversations. So from all of this input, you get a lot of information, value information on customers, exchange between customers and companies. But getting an overview is very difficult. And even if a company has its own market research department uh, for retail, it's very difficult to select more than just sound bites, very small fragments of opinions, or to track star ratings. Uh, but it's very difficult to do it manually. And I'm going to talk about it in detail, why it's better to use an automatic method, because uh, some distortion could also be result, the result of manual work. And the solution is that a tool such as opinion mining, a method that we have at Cauliflower, it looks at the text and speech feedback from consumers and evaluates this feedback. Feedback. And on the basis of this feedback, it then uh, derives a couple of main components. You can see them on the right-hand side. First of all, content. And here we need to, for instance, uh, look at thousands of different reviews. But we uh, wanted to find out what uh, the customer feedback was. You don't have to read all of this. It's done automatically. And then at the end of the day, we have an overview of the topics which were discussed in the feedback and how these topics um, were structured in detail. And the second important criterion is polarity. Was it a positive or negative review or rating? For this, we have the stars. And what additional information can I get for polarity? Now, for each and every individual topic, I understood whether it was in a positive or negative context. And you can separate. For instance, we'll see that later. Consultation is a very positive topic in the stationary trade, while customer service is often more negative. And this is where we have to separate topics into positive and negative aspects. Next, we have relations. So how are the topics related to each other, correlated? For instance, like the large uh, selection of products in uh, shop and a large range and shop, we don't have a correlation. But if it's about the appearance of the shelves or the general appearance of the shop, then we know that there is a correlation between those two topics. They belong together. And um, it gets really interesting if you look at something like there was a problem, an issue. With 
with payment. Then we know problem with payment. Okay, it's a payment problem. Problem and payment belong together, are correlated, and then we can work with it. Now, what are the benefits of automating all of this? I'm going to show you an example later on. Now, doing this in an automated method means, first of all, you have fewer distortions because you don't have to manually go through the entire feedback. You don't have to look at all of the individual items and sentences which you also have to assign manually. And if it's done manually, it's usually a team of people who work on this. And they have to then uh, do the content coding of the data. But it also means if things change over time, then you directly have to change your analysis categories. And you have not taken into account that with the COVID pandemic, contactless payments are desired by customers. That's not on my list of topics. And nobody knows what to assign it to. So then you have to go back and retrospectively, once again, evaluate all of your data manually. So the quantification of qualitative topics helps you make decisions and to develop further. And all of this goes even farther. On the basis of this, analysis can then be devised, which are the drivers or which can show you the drivers of success or failure. And all of this without any manual intervention, ideally. So the analysis that we are looking at were done without any special fine tuning by of our algorithm. In the stationary trade, we don't have that much of a practical experience. And you will see how the model is uh, based upon our general knowledge. What data sources do we have? Here, as an example, we have Google Maps. In Google Maps, we can see for Cologne a couple of examples, a couple of shops, stationary shops. And on Google Maps, there are star ratings for these shops and also text reviews. So there is a correlation or connection between topics and a rating. And this is usually, the rating is usually made after a visit. And there are major efforts going on to reduce fake reviews. And uh, later on, further filters can also be applied. But at first glance, it's a data source. Data source which we use to derive information on the shopping experience of customers in the stationary trade, potentially in the whole of uh, Germany or in our city. Now let's take a look at what people write. Well, it's quite a useful source which you can tap into. This is an exemplary review where it says an outstanding range of goods, high quality products, and a great shop. So these are the positive aspects which are mentioned here. The negative aspects, the staff um, was not competent enough, so complained. Customers really gave um, detailed feedback, distinguish between two aspects, and it's not only available for your own shop, uh, if you have several shops, but all of the shops that you would like to include in your analysis. And you'll see that later when you look at our example. So why should we automate it? Because we just understood the review that we read and we extracted a couple of interesting aspects. Yeah, it's because we have a flood of data, a large volume, and particularly if you want to do market comparisons or city comparisons between different uh, subsidiaries or shops you have, it's very difficult to, all, to do all of this manually in a structured way. Um, there are overheads like pro project management and uh, management Manual analysis really means a lot of extra effort. So how can we resolve one of the core problems of such automated text evaluations? That it should not just be keywords which you count. And it's um, with opinion mining, and one core of opinion mining is a segment where we combine topics, um, speech model, well, autonomous nominations, which could be worded differently, like a huge selection of pens, and here a um, gigantic um, well, selection of writing and paint utensils. So both of them are understood in the same way, that it's a wide range of different pens and utensils. And so huge gigantic are typical synonyms. It's quite a simple case. But a large selection, large range, you could go further. What if somebody says, if you only count keywords, if somebody said, I can find um, everything I'm looking for in this shop. I can find everything I need. Then it also means a huge selection or an appropriate selection. And with the language models which we developed, this can also be detected. Now let's take a look at a use case. We have 346 stationary shops in Berlin, Nuremberg, Munich, Hamburg, Cologne, and Frankfurt. And 
on the river mine. So from them, we collected data, 3,000 reviews approximately. It just takes a couple of seconds to collect the data, and evaluation takes a couple of minutes. And we can take a look at the aspects which were mentioned representatively for these, for these large cities and which had a positive or negative impact on the customer experience in the stationary shop. So as an approximation, first of all, we look at an overview of themes, of topics. This was created autonomously on the basis of the text. First of all, staff. 37% is the most frequent topic, staff. Then uh, the shop, the selection, customer service, good ratings, friendliness, items, price, the size of the assortment. All of the topics that we found are listed here. And it's important to say one review or one customer feedback could also address several topics, not just one. As I said, the basis are the Google Maps reviews, and no, um, none of these uh, topic complexes were created before, but this you could refine your search. So I talked about polarity, and I uh, talked a lot about correlations. Okay, if you look at the polarity of staff, that is quite a tough review, not very friendly. It's not a representative one, by the way. A disastrous staff, but a clean shop. And uh, at the same time, uh, f some people say friendly stuff. So it's a summary. So these are the elements mentioned most frequently in the reviews summed up in two or three sentences, which replaces sound bites. This is based upon approximately 400 reviews, and this is created automatically. So for every topic, we get a nice representative sound bite that we can take a look at. So we didn't filter for polarity. This is why in the same sentence, they say the staff was terrible and was very friendly. Then let's go on the shop, the actual subsidiary shop. This might be a better or more positive example, reviews on the shop. So friendly staff uh, and a good assortment. So it's so assortment, order, friendliness, customer service, and a large selection. This is what is said here. This is the summary of what was said about the shop. Now, the reason why these summaries, which are created automatically, why these summaries might be quite uh, broad and also embed a couple of other topics is because in a review, you usually get a holistic reflection of uh, the customer's impression of a shop. Then we have selection, a choice, a great selection, a choice, um, well, a very orderly shop. This is self-explanatory. It's really quite positive, hardly any polarity. Then customer service, great service, um, competence, friendliness. This is what is uh, said here generally, but it could also be distinguished um, from friendliness, which is different from customer service. Uh, friendliness also means politeness or support when you return an item. Then another example, good rating. That's uh, quite an interesting topic because you could derive it from the star ratings, and this is primarily about general good feedback, which is clustered here. And it includes things like, my visit to the shop today was pleasant, and that's a good rating for us. So all of these ratings that uh, you have on the polarity circle, positive, negative, neutral, all of these ratings um, um, based on a sentiment model, and it's not just star ratings, but the polarity of language, which is considered here. So we talked about polarity, about topics. Now comes a slightly more complex graph. Here, we are showing how the topics are related to each other, correlations between topics. That's a co-occurrence matrix here, and it's a matrix of things that um, are mentioned together, shown as a network, which topics emerge together. And here, in terms of understanding, we uh, move away from understanding and go towards interpretation. So what topics are related with a good rating or what drives a good rating? Anything that's shown in orange here are drivers for good rating, for good review. Um, and all is primarily associated with it. Later on, we are going to see whether it's a driver. For instance, beauty, nice appearance of the shelves, of the items, of the goods, and the general uh, appearance and appeal, and also the size of the shop, friendliness, the choice, the general shopping experience, uh, the advice given, the large of uh, the, uh, the, the 
the size of the assortment are related to a good rating. But we are not um, indicating here whether, um, I mean, friendliness, friendliness, uh, whether it has an Im impact on a good rating, we cannot say it here. But they are just related to each other. That's all we know now. We know it from this network. So that's another method for interpretation. Now, what we will see here, we are going to go through it together, is a standard tool. And it's available in our software. It's the driver analysis. Now, in a driver analysis, we saw that we have a couple of correlations, but we really want to find out what drives a better rating or a better review. How do you get better reviews and how can you improve your own rating? For this, we have two axes. On the horizontal axis, uh, the share, and on the vertical axis, the importance for positive star rating. So the higher it is on the uh, vertical axis, uh, the better is the star rating. On the right-hand side, we will see the higher share. Now, if you express it in a picture, on the right-hand side, we see the number of nominations. Um, for instance, for customer service or staff, they are mentioned very often. On the left-hand side, we have a lower um, share of, ma of or number of times this is mentioned. And then we have another axis. We have importance of star ratings on the vertical axis. And you can also separate it into two sectors, low importance, high importance. So the higher up it is on the vertical axis, the more important is it for a star rating. The lower down it is on the vertical axis, the less important is it for your star rating. And based upon this, we will now create quadrants. And these quadrants are very useful for interpretation. I'd like to explain them to you. And let's start with quadrant one. These are important topics which are often mentioned. For instance, typical example is customer service. In quadrant two, we have marginal topics that are not mentioned so often. So in quadrant two, fewer nominations but higher importance. These might be topics that um, might be a USP where you could beat your competition because uh, there are not so many people who can offer it and they still have a high impact on customers' perception in quadrant three. The topic is uh, neither has a high share nor is it important. Uh, these are marginal issues and, for instance, you could... Um, distinguish your business from your competitors. And number four, these are cosmetic or hygienic factors, or maybe I shouldn't call them that, but they are less important but have a high share. So these are things which are not going to have a major impact on the visit to the shop or the experience of the shopper, but which account for a relatively large share of the nominations of um, items mentioned. And then one can try to interpret this and to learn from the reviews. And in the automated uh, topic-based evaluation, you will see what works well in your shop, what doesn't work so well, where should you invest. And just a minor excursion. I talked a lot about um, importance and assignment. In quadrants one and four, um, different in that in quadrant one, you have a high importance and mentioned quite often. In quadrant four, large number of um, ty or high share of um, being mentioned and uh, not so important, and it's because, like the large car park of a do-it-yourself store. In quadrant number four, that would mean for do-it-yourself store, that would be in quadrant four, because, I mean, if you have a large car park, that's nice, but everyone has it. All of the DIY stores have it, and uh, if it is mentioned in your reviews, it doesn't really drive your differentiation between one do-it-yourself store and another. It's just a um, feature that all of the DIY stores have, so it's um, in quadrant four. If it's in quadrant one, it's, it's different. Now, let's take a look at um, the various topics. If you want to measure the shopping impulse, what drives a positive um, experience of a visit to a shop? And here at the very top, of course, we can see the good ratings, which is self-explanatory. A good rating is important so that um, generally, your shop is rated very well, but below it, we have customer service shown in red. And red-green means um, a coefficient changing to the positive or negative, uh, and, and red means it has a negative impact on the star rating, or a very high one in the other case. 
It's a very important topic which has a major negative influence on your star rating. So where people complain about customer service, it's very difficult to get a high star rating. That's what it means if we have a red dot behind customer service. And we also see a factor which I mentioned before, it's payment. Now, payment um, only accounts for a small share of the reviews. And it's about whether you can use a credit card or um, EC card, whether it's cash only or how does payment work. And for payment, it um, drives the star rating in a negative direction, but it's not very present. So this is a feature where you have to think about whether it's a possible differentiation for your shop if you can offer contactless payment. And then we also have staff and um, the shop itself in German filiale. They are also have a negative impact mentioned quite often. And together with customer service, they can be found in quadrant number two. And we have a few more topics, such as selection, choice. In German Auswahl, you can see uh, the lines between importance and share. And uh, choice or selection is very important, but only has an average driving power for the overall rating. Now, let's take a look at it once again. One could say, right, all of these reviews um, are either very positive or very positive, but that's not true. Because um, after analyzing all of these reviews, we have four stars. And um, if you filter for reviews mentioning customer service, you get 3.6 stars, which is uh, worth. And if you filter for reviews that say good rating as a topic, then you get 4.7 stars. And it's similar when you look at positive consultation, which I have not mentioned before. That's also quite a frequently mentioned topic, and it has a positive impact. And this is, in fact, where we would uh, expect a similar result. And I guess with this, I'm at the end of my presentation, and we would be very happy if uh, you visit us at Cauliflower and if you try it out yourself on our own website. And we have lots of other possible applications for software. We have text and speech basis based analysis. And I look forward to any questions you might have or any comments. Yeah, thank you very much. Jean Lucas Peranza. Well, it was something that was not so easy to absorb because lots of uh, figures, very mathematical. I mean, for you, that's your world that you've been living in. You've been working with data for a long time. But um, I would like to ask our audience, our, the chat, are there no, no questions from the chat? Now, does anyone here in the audience have any questions? It is a very complex topic. I think you have to try it out for yourself. Um, now, using practical experience, and you gave us an example like the large car park at a do-it-yourself store. Now, specifically, what would be the concrete benefit for the stationary industry, for the retailers in the stationary industry? Well, I think there it's above all the databases. Now, if you look at market comparisons, if you look at how the satellite jobs of competitors, your own jobs or newly opened jobs, how they develop and which aspects are particularly appreciated by customers and what leads to the customer coming back to your shop. You want to identify these success drivers and for this purpose, it's a very appropriate method. I can imagine that some of you might think, but it's really quite, quite sophisticated, quite a lot of effort, because many of the small retailers are family-owned uh, shops and not a lot of manpower. So what do you think how much time needs to be invested here? Now, for this, I think it's about one hour that you would have to invest. Um, and then you get the first results per day, or depending on the project. Yeah, to set up the project, to establish the project, to identify the relevant data, then trigger the analysis together and take a look at it. That can be done really quickly. And all of this is um, can be done without any manual encoding. You don't need a labeled data set where you already assign comments to existing topics. So within half an hour, for instance, with the 2,700 reviews, you've done them within this time, analyzed them, and with an interactive dashboard, you can then look at the results and learn something about your customers. By the way, interactive, you already mentioned, or oh, you have those emojis, and in many large shops, they are used for customers to um, well give their opinion when they leave the shop using such an emoji. Do you think this investment is worthwhile, or how much does it cost approximately? Now, if you want to talk about uh, the analysis of those contacts, 
after the visit to the shop, we are not offering this. But I would say it's really worthwhile, definitely, if you ask your customer after the visit to the shop whether they like it or not. But what we are really specialized in is online data, data sources which are available online. So anything that comes from social media monitoring, customer reviews at Google Maps, all the way to product reviews, that's one of our hobby horses. And then, of course, um, targeted market research so that we can ask customers about their opinions um, for different purposes. That's rather our specialty. But uh, if you already work with a partner and if on a regular basis you get uh, speech feedback from your customers and you don't know what to do with it because it's really quite expensive and time-consuming to evaluate it, there we can really assist you as well. So complete um, hands-off with an API or with a software solution um, data in tables can be uploaded very easily. I'd like to once again ask our audience, does anyone have a question? Because sometimes you know what it's like, you sit there in the audience and you think to yourself, yeah, I'd really be interested, but you don't want to break the ice. So I can do that instead of our audience. Now, when you look at your customers and you also have really large players whom you advise in the car industry, for instance, and if you now look at this industry, the stationary industry, just by way of a summary for our audience, what are the biggest differences, but also the, the interfaces where you say this is the same for all industries? Now there, we're talking about major differences. We also have a lot of experience in a different um, retail segment, FMCG, and further retail applications. We gathered a lot of experience. Uh, well, there are similar topics, like in the stationary trade, that concern everyone, but uh, do not really create the same kind of emotional response like the car industry, where everybody has an opinion. But these are everyday topics concerning all of us. So I would say uh, asking customers after a visit whether they liked it, or the Google Maps analysis, or well, dedicated market research is required to enrich data, produce data, and this, in this way, it's similar to other industries that um, will offer consumer articles, fast-moving goods uh, that are not communicated so much on social media. Now, it's easier in the car industry to get feedback. In other industries, it's more difficult, and it's ideal if you, on a regular basis, uh, collect customer feedback but don't really know what to do with it. Now, do you think, um, I'm just going to ask this question, do you think that for the retailers, particularly for the small family-owned shops, that it's worthwhile? Or would you say it's a rather recommendable for a franchise store or somebody with a couple of stores? I think it starts really paying off if you have several shops or if you already have some feedback from your customers. For this, you don't need to be a major player. We offer entry-level versions at a three-digit euro amount, so you can start really quickly, you can test it really quickly, and we are happy to offer free-of-charge test runs, but it gets even more interesting the less it is possible for you to establish this personal contact with your customer via such channels and cultivate this contact. So the, the larger the amount of data, the more worthwhile will it be. Okay, so then I would like to say thank you very much. And of course, if anyone has a question later on, our speaker will stay around for a couple of minutes um, at the counter, at the entrance. And if you have questions, go in, uh, approach Mr. Speranza. Thank you very much for this presentation and the interesting input um, and insight into the world of data and use of data, particularly in relation to the stationary industry. Thank you very much.